Welcome back to what is now the second video on this series on rose and perfumery. So in the last video, we covered a bit about rose, where it's grown, and how it's processed into the absolute and the oil, which are the raw materials used in perfumery. We also went and evaluated some real Bulgarian rose oil, and then we also evaluated some synthetic rose bases to see how those compared. We're now gonna move on to taking a bit more of a deep dive into the actual constituents of the rose oil itself, starting in this video with a series of chemical compounds called the terpenes. Before we begin our discussion on the terpenes which are found inside of rose, I wanted to go back to the end of the last video where we evaluated the two rose bases and the damask rose oil. And the reason for that is because now that these raw materials have been sitting on the scent strip for a week, we're gonna be able to get a much better idea of how they act in the mid to base note region of the perfume, as opposed to when we just went and smelled them straight away. That's how they would smell immediately after opening the perfume bottle, or how they would smell in the top note region, as you might like to say. So let's go and smell these things again. I'm gonna start off with the rose damask oil from Bulgaria, and let's have a look. So this is much, much fainter now, and actually this is the case with all of these three. They're far fainter than they were to begin with. And what that goes to show is they're really reaching the end of their lifespan on the scent strip at this stage. So given that that's been about a week, I would say that you could classify this as somewhere between a mid and a bass note. And rose is commonly regarded as a mid note. So this gives you an idea for kind of how it's gonna last in your perfume. Now, when I smell this, I can still smell just a faint hint of the rose. I still get that petal smell that's quite delicate, and I still get a bit of the kind of fruitiness, a bit of the sweetness. I also get a little bit of a mustiness, I would say, almost like as if you've had a kind of petals which have just been sitting there for a while. Overall though, the scent is quite faint. Now, moving on to the rose essence or the feminish base. So again, I'm gonna go smell this. And I have to say, this is fairly similar, I guess, still to the rose oil. So I would say the rose essence is actually a little bit fainter, um, but it does quite well at preserving some of the delicate nuances in the rose smell. I would say it still has a bit of that kind of uh, airy aura or that kind of uh, rose petal smell about it. Then finally, the rose jivko. So this one, now immediately this one is a lot stronger. That's, I would say, the main thing I noticed about it. But on this one, there's really more of an emphasis on that kind of musty rose petal smell. I don't get quite so much of the cleanness or the breeziness of the rose petals coming through. Um, it's a bit more powdery, um, a little bit more heavy, but again, it's also a bit stronger. So what that suggests to me is whatever component is causing that kind of um, slightly more musty kind of slightly heavier part of the rose scent. Uh, they've used more of that in the rose jivko than the feminish rose essence. So that also means if you're looking to prolong the rose note in your perfume, then maybe having some rose jivko would be a good way to go just because you're getting that longevity. However, if you're going for more of a accurate and natural smell, than the real rose oil or the rose essence base. Anyway, I just wanted to give that quick update on those because I do think it's quite important when studying perfumery, not just to smell things at face value immediately when you dip the scent strip, but also to go and monitor how the smells change over time. Anyway, now let's move on to the rose terpenes. So before I begin, I'm just gonna let you know how I'm actually finding the constituents of the rose. So firstly, I'm using this book that I introduced in the last video, Scent and Chemistry. This book is really good for a lot of natural raw materials, or at least the ones it covers, which are usually the most uh, common or most popular ones. And it's quite good at actually breaking down the uh, individual aroma chemicals, or at least the major ones which are inside those oils. And often it gives a percentage, the actual amount that was used or the amount that's found in the natural. So this book is a really good reference. Another reference I'm using is a GCMS analysis of Bulgarian rose oil, which can be found on the Good Sense Company website. I'll put a link in the description below to that. If you're not aware of what a GCMS is, I'll quickly try to explain. So a GCMS analysis is something that chemists do when they're trying to work out all the different components in a mixture of something. GCMS, what that stands for is gas chromatography mass spectrometry. So essentially it's a machine with two halves to it. The first part is the gas chromatography part. So what happens here is a chemist takes a sample vial of the thing that they want to analyze, and then they put that with a tube going through it, which has some carrier gas, so some kind of inert gas. 
what happens is as the gas goes through the tube, um, it picks up some of the vapor phase of the analyte. So um, whatever's inside the sample bottle, that gets carried along this long winding tube with the gas. Now, some of the chemicals or some of the components inside the sample prefer to travel quite quickly through the gas, whereas others like to take some time off to stick to the walls of the, um, of the pipe for a bit. All of the chemicals, they periodically, in kind of an equilibrium, spend some of their time floating in the gas and some of their time kind of docked on the walls. So, because all the different chemicals, all the different components, they prefer to spend a different amount of time or a different proportion of the time while they're in the tube on the walls, it means that the things actually end up moving through the tube at a different speed. And what that does is it separates them out. So by the time you get to the end of the tube, that's when you reach the MS or the mass spectrometry component of the machine. What happens here is you've got essentially um, a special component which can go and as each uh, chemical comes through the end of the tube, it can kind of take a little analysis or a kind of snapshot of it and that can be compared uh, to a database of known chemicals and that can be used to work out what it is that was traveling through the tube. So what this does is it produces a nice big list of uh, all of the components that could be identified by the machine and also the proportion or the, uh, the percentage in which they're at. So you can imagine this is really useful for analyzing something like a rose oil because it tells you all the different things that are inside it and at what amounts. So that's what a uh, GCMS report is. Also, someone commented quite kindly on the video from last time about a GCMS report that they got given when they bought their rose oil. Now, normally you wouldn't get given the GCMS report when you buy something, but in this case they did and they shared uh, some of the entries on that. So that's three different references that we can go and look at to kind of get an idea for the values. As I'm sure you can imagine, there are hundreds of different constituents inside of rose oil. And we're obviously not going to be able to cover every single one of them inside the video. Um, and even we're not going to be able to cover all of the ones I want to cover in this video. It's actually going to be a few videos in the series that take up just the constituents. And in this video, we are focusing on the terpenes. So the first question is, what are terpenes? Well, the word terpene comes from turpentine, which is the oil obtained from the resin of pine trees. Um, you can use it uh, for certain things like when you're oil painting, for example, I think you can use it as a solvent. So the thing about turpentine is it was noticed that it had all of these different components and all of these different components which shared quite similar structural similarities. And that's where the name uh, terpene came from. And it was defined in chemistry as essentially a series of chemicals made up of subunits of isoprene. Now isoprene, or is technical term, 2-methylbutane residues, these are a certain uh, structural pattern that you find in chemistry, and terpenes are just having lots of these stitched together. You can also call, uh, with these isoprene units, as they're called, you can also assign them a head and a tail, which just kind of shows you which direction round they're laying on the molecule. Now, there are a lot of these terpenes. In fact, over 30,000 different terpenes are known. But a big subclass is the monoterpenes, and this is important to us because a lot of monoterpenes are actually aroma chemicals. So a monoterpene is when you have just two of these isoprene units that are stitched together. And most of the time it happens with a head attaching to a tail, though it doesn't have to be that. So the first one we're going to look at is linalool. When you look at the structure of linalool, you can actually see how these two isoprene units are attached together. And in fact, that's the case for all of the aroma chemicals that I'm going to cover today. But anyway, in terms of perfumery, what we really care about the most is how does it actually smell? Well, to me, I would say it actually smells a little bit herbaceous, um, but it's also quite soft. And linalool is something you find a lot um, all over the place in, in just, about, um, just about every kind of uh, fragrance product you get, really. And that's because it's found in so many natural oils, but also you can add it on its own. And it's, I would say, quite a soothing, soft kind of smell. Um, maybe a bit associated with cleaning products just because it's used so much in those. But it, to me, it does have this kind of slightly spiky uh, herbal or herbaceous aspect. I kind of, for some reason in my head, when I think of linalool, I kind of think of kind of yellow and green spots together. I don't know why I think of that. It's just what I think of. 
But yeah, so linalool is found in rows at approximately 2-3%, to and it's not something that I think really gives the rose its character, it's definitely not a rose smell, but it's more just something that's found in a lot of natural products. And I would say it's a top to mid note. It doesn't last a particularly long time, but it lasts longer than some of the most top notes that you get. Next up we have Rose Oxide, which is technically a monocyclic terpene as it's called in chemistry, and the reason for that is simply because there is a ring in the structure when you look at it. But again, you can still see how you've got these two isoprene units come together to make this molecule. Now, Rose Oxide, um, as I'm sure you could tell by the name, does have a certain distinctive rose smell. It clearly is quite important to the smell of roses. And this one is very interesting because when you look at the percentage, it seems that it's quite a low percentage, definitely less than a percent in the uh, rose oil. However, according to uh, the book Senate and Chemistry, um, it actually has quite an outsized effect on the smell or an outsized contribution, and it's actually quite important. Now, when I smell this, um, it reminds me a bit of something we'll cover in one of the next videos, which is phenylethyl alcohol. Um, and how I'd describe it is a very diffusive kind of like a uh, petal, um, a very classically floral smell, but also a little bit uh, stemmy maybe as well, a bit like the stems or the, the greenery of the floral. But it's it's very kind of uh, diffusive and, you know, it's a bit like, um, it's very kind of soft and space filling rather than um, more of like a, it's not so much like a specific note, like you might uh, say a note in a melody, it's very much more like just a quite a wide diffusive uh, background sound. Um, but it does definitely make you think of the rose just because of this kind of, um, because when you do go and smell a rose I think you do get this kind of diffusive pestle like smell and it reminds me of just quite a shimmering version of that. Now the one thing about this I found is it's actually very short-lived, it's very much a top note and it only lasts on the scent strip for a few hours. So if you're having trouble smelling this, don't just leave it on the scent strip for ages and then come back to it and wonder, you know, why, why can't I smell it anymore? It is because it actually is very much a top note and it only lasts a little while. And I also find when you um, dip your scent strip, as soon as you've kind of opened the bottle, you can already start smelling uh, the rose oxide. Though at the same time, the first time I tried to smell this, the rose oxide, um, I didn't kind of pick it up straight away, it took me a while to kind of actually notice exactly what the smell was, so if it's your first time with it, don't worry if you don't smell it straight away, um, just keep trying, I would say. Also, just for reference, the rose oxide that I've got is diluted to 1%, unlike most of the other things I have here, which are 10%, and that's just owing to the fact that it's quite strong. Next, we have something called Farnesol. Now, this one is a bit different from uh, some of the other terpenes that I'm going to cover in this episode, and that's because this is actually a sesquiterpene, uh, which is just a fancy term for saying instead of two of those isoprene units together, you've actually got three of those building blocks stuck together to make this. So that also means that this is a bit of a longer, bigger molecule. Another thing about this one is in converse to the rose oxide, this one also lasts a lot longer on the scent strip. Um, this I would say lasts at least a week or so. Um, so I would definitely put this with the kind of mid to base notes and I assume out of what is actually left on those scent strips uh, for the rose, that Farnesol is probably one of those components. Now, when I go to smell this, it is quite an interesting smell. I think it's quite hard to pinpoint. And I would kind of classify it as foliage because it's kind of a smell that reminds me of, you know, when you're walking uh, through the countryside on a spring's day, that kind of thing. But it has different elements in there. It reminds me a bit of fresh leaves, um, a bit of kind of plants in the spring, a bit of kind of twigs and woody stems, and a bit of uh, blossoms and petals, those kind of things. Right, so next we're going to look at something called citronellol. Now this one is really quite important in rose, and that's because this is found at almost 40%. So I think this is one of the largest, if not the largest, constituent of rose oil. So citronellol, what does it smell like? Now this one for me, um, it actually smells very much kind of like citronella, which I guess is what it's named after. Um, and if you've ever used insect repellent candles, then you might well know that smell, because that's usually what they put in them. I think citronella, uh, which is another natural, I think that is a natural insect repellent. So what it smells like is, you know, almost a bit lemony, I would say. And I think it does remind 
me a bit of rose, especially when I first put it on the scent strip, or maybe just because, especially when I smell citronella on its own, and I'm not smelling these other rose components, I definitely feel like I get the um, citronella aspect come through. And it's, yeah, this kind of bitter, maybe a bit lemony, a, li a little bit um, kind of twiggy, and I think it does have a kind of rose aspect in there as well, but I don't think you would pick it up if you'd smelled uh, citronella for the first time. It's only when you start to kind of smell it in the context of these other things that you start to kind of uh, clock that, oh yeah, I can see this being in rose. And even though that this is quite a high percentage, almost 40% in the rose oil, according to the book Scent of Chemistry, because of the way that our olfactory receptors work and uh, send the information to our brain, um, or maybe the way just that it's composed, um, the citronella, you only perceive it at about the same strength as the rose oxide, even though that it's many, many times greater in concentration. Now, we've just looked at citronella, and the next thing I want to look at is not actually something found in rose, this is the only outlier in this video, but it's something called citronellic acid, and I thought I would uh, share this one just because I happened to come across a little sample of it, and it's actually quite a rare raw material. It's something you wouldn't really use very often. And all that's happened is one of the functional groups, so part of that citronella structure has been switched out for a different functional group. It's gone from being what's called in chemistry an alcohol to a carboxylic acid. So all that means is the molecules are very similar, but they're slightly different. So um, this citronellic acid, what does that smell like? Now this, interestingly, does not smell like citronella and definitely doesn't smell like rose. But this to me smells like old paper, old cardboard, or like old fabric. And when I say old, I mean really old. Imagine you'd opened up an old room which hadn't been touched in like 20 years or something like that. Um, it's a really interesting smell. And I think maybe one of the reasons you would use this is if you were trying to create uh, one of those uh, very specific smells, probably something you wouldn't do very often in fine fragrance, but maybe if you had uh, more of kind of an olfactory um, I don't know, art exhibition, or, or you were trying to do something a bit more creative, then there's probably some very niche cases where you might actually want to use this. And again, this one's quite strong. It's diluted down to 1%, but you can still uh, perceive it very strongly. Okay, so next we're going to look at Neryl. Now, the uh, numbers for how much Neryl there is in the rose oil, they seem to differ quite a lot depending on which source you look at. Um, so it's kind of unclear, but it seems like there is a reasonable amount of Neryl in the rose. Now this to me smells, it reminds me firstly of the citronella a little bit, but it's, it doesn't quite have that same citronella aspect to it. And to me, it also reminds me a bit of the geranial, which is another thing we'll cover in just a second. And to me, it's got kind of a sweetness to it. And it's got, again, this kind of twiggy, kind of foliage kind of smell. It's quite hard to describe, I guess. Um, but yeah, that's kind of roughly where I put it. It's a bit bitter uh, as well. And I think I lied because another thing I've got here is neryl acetate. And I said that the citronellic acid would be the only thing that's not found in rose. Um, I actually didn't find any numbers for neryl acetate being in uh, the rose as well. So it's quite possible this isn't actually present. Um, but I thought it would be interesting again because this is um, an aroma chemical and it's the acetate version of the neryl. So if you looked at my acetates video a while back, um, you might remember how I say that for a lot of uh, things, you can make an acetate version of them. So this is just that happening right now. So when you go and smell the neryl acetate, this time you get something that's a lot sweeter, and to me it's more fruity. It also does smell a bit more kind of chemical, in a sense maybe, or a bit more unnatural. Um, but you can see that it's remnant of the neryl, um, but it's kind of it's kind of changed its character a little bit. It's brought it from something that's more bitter and twiggy and that kind of direction, and maybe a bit citrus as well, you could say, to something that is a bit more kind of uh, sweeter and fruity, but it still kind of has that twigginess um, and still has a hint of bitterness. So yeah, it's quite interesting. Okay, so that's the Neryl series, or the series of Neryl and Neryl Acetate. Now we're gonna one-up it and go to the Geranial series where I've actually got three different versions of it. So, Geranial is quite a key component, again, of the rose oil, and this one, it seems to be found at around 14%, which is, again, quite high. 
And so the geranial, what does that smell like? Now, to me, the geranial, it reminds me of both the Nerol a bit and the uh, Citronella. But the geranial is definitely quite clearly a bit more rose. It definitely immediately, you, you can kind of smell that it's closer to rose. Though that said, it's still a bit bitter um, and I would say fairly sharp. But it is more leaning towards um, kind of maybe like a pink smell, whereas the other ones reminded me a bit more of kind of foliage. Um, this one, I think the geranial, reminds me more of um, kind of, albeit sharp, more of a kind of floral or a pink kind of smell. And again, with the longevity, um, the geranial seems to be somewhere between a mid and a top note from uh, at least how long I felt it lasted on the scent strip, definitely more than a day, but probably not quite to a week. So then we have the two derivatives, as they're called, which are the modified versions of the geranial. And both of these are found inside the rose oil, though at much, much smaller proportions. So the, um, the simplest one is the geranial formate. We've just added a small bit onto the molecular structure. And this one, so this one is quite interesting because to me, this smells, I would say, maybe even more fruity, but it's quite sharp. And it reminds me of maybe a kind of lychee kind of fruit kind of smell, that kind of thing. And maybe almost leaning slightly in a rhubarb direction, though it's very kind of um, tart. It's like a bitter fruity smell. And it maybe reminds me of, well, what I would think, you know, those kind of red berries, like the poisonous berries you're not meant to eat. It kind of reminds me a bit what those smell like or what you might imagine those might taste like. And you do still kind of get this rose, slight rose nuance. And I think this is more owing to the fact that, um, you know, rose actually is kind of almost a, a fruity leaning floral. And I think some fruits also share some of these rose components in them. Now, the journal acetate, on the other hand, this one is a sim very similar to the geranial formate, it's just got one extra carbon group in there. So again, it's got this very distinctive acetate smell. Um, if you watch my video on acetates, you probably have noticed me talking about this distinctive smell that the acetates have. This very much has that. And it also reminds me very much of the neural acetate. So by having the acetate, both the uh, on the neural and the geranial, um, the acetate versions smell quite similar and I think that is due to the acetate group. Now, to me, when I smell journal acetate, I have always thought of it, um, I don't know why I thought of it like this, but I've kind of thought of it as this um, quite crystalline or like rasping, maybe kind of like a, um, a mineral smell. And I don't think that's what most people would call a mineral smell, but it's just how, how it is in my head. Um, and I kind of imagine, you know, like the smell of crystals or something, if they had a smell, um, this is what it would smell like. So it's kind of, it's interesting because it's a bit chemically, a bit synthetic, but it's also kind of sweet. And I wouldn't say this particularly reminds me of rose, but also I can kind of see that this smell is actually kind of close to rose in a sense at the same time when I really think about it. So, it's interesting, again, looking at these things like the series, because the geranial, the geranial acetate, and the geranial formate, they all have this kind of shared certain tone of smell, you might like to call it. And in the same way for the neural and the neural acetate, maybe not the citronellal and the citronellic acid so much. Um, those two are quite radically different. Um, but again, having a carboxylic acid group in a perfumery molecule is quite rare at the same time. So maybe it's something to do with the fact that carboxylic acid molecules, um, often associated with vinegary smells, um, don't usually lend themselves to the kind of nice smells. Anyway, that's all I've got to say on these terpenes. Those are the ones that I picked out and the ones which I actually have, which I can smell in front of you guys. And next time in the next video, we're going to start to look at something else. So there are a few other series that I want to cover inside the rose constituents. So there are the aldehydes, there are also the damascones and ionones, and then there are some other few little random things which I don't really think fit into a specific group. So I'll probably be doing three more videos on the constituents, um, but we'll see how it goes. One final quick thing, if any of you uh, use my web store for perfumery supplies, 
quick update is that I finally got sample bottles back in stock. So it took me a while to get these back in stock because I originally had one supplier which was really good in terms of value for money and allowed me to offer a lot of sample bottles at a cheap price, which is pretty much the aim of the store, kind of to be able to give you a good value on regular perfumery supplies all in one place. But um, I did have an issue which was that a lot of these bottles I was receiving um, they weren't really packaging them properly, so they kept getting smashed in the posts, which meant I had to spend hours and hours and hours cleaning them, and it wasn't really practical, and also the nice packs of the bottles were kind of incomplete after some had smashed, so it also made it kind of difficult. Now I've managed to find a much better supplier for the bottles. I've got um, some much more high quality bottles, though unfortunately they are a little bit more expensive. The good thing about the new bottles is there is a range of different bottles and also the caps. So one thing that you might notice with uh, perfumery bottles is that um, the regular kind of essential oil caps that they sell um, when they're selling essential oils, um, the plastic on those caps isn't always very good. Sometimes you have raw materials evaporating up through the cap so you can have so much of a raw material and then later on you have less of it or for your perfume samples that you make. And then uh, other times things can kind of happen, like you can even get, um, sometimes the caps starting to dissolve in with the vapours of the raw materials, which kind of, um, that's not very nice either because you're kind of getting plastic in some of the raw materials. So really for perfumery, what you want to be using is ideally polycone lined caps, which have this inert barrier and a really tight seal, which make it really good. So now I'm selling the polycone cap bottles on my web store. So if you're having trouble getting hold of those, then that's one option in case it's convenient for you. I say that because I know in some countries the shipping may be a little bit more expensive. Um, so it really depends on where you live, if my store will be the best option for you or somewhere else. And you can just Google these things. So there are a few different places selling them online. But yeah, polycone caps, that is definitely something I would recommend for perfumery. Anyway, thanks for watching this video, guys. I know it's been a bit of a long one, um, but I hope you enjoyed the blend of kind of uh, the perfumery side of things, what things smell like, but also maybe some of the chemistry side of things. Um, I'm not planning to go too much into the chemistry on all the videos. It's just specifically for this whole topic of the terpenes. I thought it kind of made sense just to cover that once. So anyone who was interested in terpenes and what all that means, um, has some kind of video as a reference to go back and actually understand, ah yes, like a terpene, this means such and such. Anyway, thanks for watching guys and I'll see you soon with the next video.